I am a founder of Conversion Sciences. Now, Conversion Science is, is an agency that uses data to redesign websites. We are, um, uh, you know, at the outset, we're doing the same thing that a creative agency does. Only when we redesign a website, we design it using data that we collect from our existing customers. And I'm going to show you the things that we do to make uh, that allow us to guarantee that our website we redesign for you is going to improve the performance of your website. We can guarantee that our redesigned website will have a higher conversion rate, will be selling more revenue, will have higher average order values if you're running an e-commerce site. Um, this is, may, might sound surprising to some of you, but um, um, by the time we're done, you're going to understand how um, the, the marketplace has changed. We have amazing new tools that are inexpensive and easy to use. And all of us as marketers, digital marketers, are going to have to be using these tools um, in all of our, not just our website redesigns, but in all of our digital campaigns. First, I'm going to tell you a story. This is the website finish line. This is a well-known brand, certainly a well-known brand uh, in North America, and they um, uh, are, are well known for selling shoes and apparel, sports apparel. Um, they have both brick and mortar stores as well as this website. And this website was a significant source of revenue back on November 18th, 2012. The very next day, this is what their website looked like. They had done a complete redesign. This is very stylish. This is very unique, a big change for their brand. You can imagine how excited the executives were and how excited the agency was. I mean, look at this, very bold colors and images. Um, their, um, their photography was uh, upgraded, so it had models and was um, really highlighted the, the details on the shoe, on the, uh, on the products. The, uh, they, they brought in content from the blog so that visitors to their website could in, um, read more about the, the brands that they support. And they simplified, they, they cut away all of the color, the clutter on their category pages. Even their spokes, the, their, their, their branded products were boldly presented. So this looks like a really big win, a really big um, benefit for uh, Finish Line. Unfortunately, within a couple of weeks, they had lost about $3 million in sales. The new site, within a few weeks, had dropped their conversion rate, had dropped their revenue per visit. Everything was headed down. How could this happen? How could this happen that a well-funded creative agency, an experienced executive team, could come together and get all the way down to the launch of a website and not realize that the performance was going to drop. Well, this is what I'm going to talk about because not only is this happening with our redesigns, this is happening with our email campaigns. This is happening with our paid search campaigns. And this is even happening with our organic traffic. We are making assumptions about our audience that are working against us. And the reason, the, the, the thing that we do to keep from making these kinds of assumptions is called science. Now, everyone who is here, I want you to realize that you are listening and decided to visit us for a session about behavioral science, science of behavior. So uh, you're very special. You're the kind of people I want to talk to because you're the ones who are beginning to realize that I need science to get myself, to get my um, biases out of the way so that I don't make mistakes like the design team and the agency did at Finish Line. Any one of you listening 
is completely capable of using science in the service of your prospects and customers. Any one of you, you are already wired for behavioral science. You do not need to go to school and get a PhD. You do not need a master's. You do not need to take lots of statistics courses. You are already wired. And I know this because I, my 14-year-old son was already wired for behavioral science. He, when he was 14, was building his first computer, first big desktop computer he had. Now, the kids don't go to the malls anymore and hang out there. They don't go to the, um, the soccer fields and hang out there anymore. They hang out online. They're on Skype with their headsets in a fantasy world, in a digital world, either Minecraft when they're young, or World of Warcraft, or League of Legends, which is an eSport that they play. Um, and these days, I think it's Fortnite that is really popular. So this computer was really important, where his social world existed. And if he did this wrong, he was going to have a computer that was going to compromise his ability to hang out with friends and play games and all the things that he did. He was spending his own money, and he did not want to mess this up. Now, he had specified everything meticulously. He had um, specified the high-performance monitor, the high-performance graphics card, the right memory, and even down to the right keyboard with the proper action on the keys and this right size mouse pad. And he was down to his last thing, the motherboard. The motherboard is really important. Everything plugs into the motherboard. And if he got this choice wrong, he was going to have a brick instead of a computer. He had narrowed it down to two motherboards. Uh, both of them were the same price. They both had the features that he needed for his computer. And one was rated four stars. The other was rated five stars. So if my son was not a natural behavioral scientist, he would have said, well, four stars is better than five stars. I'm sorry, five stars is better than four stars. So let's buy the five star motherboard. But even at that tender age, he was smart enough to know to go and look at how many reviews were driving these ratings. What he was doing was he was looking at the sample size that was driving the data. Now, I didn't tell him to do this. He didn't use the words sample size, but this is what statisticians call little n. That's the variable they use for this. And he naturally knew to go and look at this. And he said, well, the four-star motherboard had 250 reviews. The five-star motherboard only had five reviews. So his mind was calculating the margin of error or the confidence interval. Again, he didn't use these words, but he was already wired to understand that the four-star motherboard with 250 reviews, it might be a three-star motherboard, it might be a five-star motherboard, but the five-star motherboard with only five reviews could very well be a one-star motherboard when, it, when all the data is in. So there was more risk with the five-star motherboard than with the four-star motherboard. He was also calculating what statisticians call big N, the variable big N, which is the total population. In other words, all of the motherboards that had been sold. And he calculated that with a sample size of five, they probably haven't sold that many motherboards altogether if there's only five reviews. So either that motherboard's not very good and it's not selling well, or it's brand new on the market and could have some hidden problems. Whereas the four-star motherboard has obviously sold more, has generated a lot more reviews. You are not going to be surprised by any of this because you too are wired for this. Whenever you go onto Facebook and you look at how many shares, how many comments, and how many likes you got on a post, you're using other people's behaviors to decide if you're gonna post more information about that or more posts like that in the future. When you choose a movie based on reviews in the paper or the Rotten Tomatoes freshness score, you are using other people's behaviors to make decisions in your life. And we want you to do more of that. We have done this with hundreds of people. These are our clients and our partners who have worked with us. We have done this with Russian literature majors. 
they have earned their lab coat. And when you achieve a certain level of capability as one of our clients, we send you your lab coat. Every one of you is capable of learning your lab coat. And I'm wearing one right now as I speak. So give yourselves a round of applause. Give yourself a hand because you are designs. And I'm gonna take you through the process of designing a landing page. Now landing pages are really, 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 really powerful. Almost any digital marketing campaign or website redesign is going to involve designing landing pages. Landing pages are great for accepting clicks from emails, from um, social media posts, and even catching clicks from your uh, own website. Now, when I talk about a landing page, I'm talking about a very specific kind of page, not just a page where people are entering your website. This is actually a page that has two very specific jobs. The first job of a landing page is to keep the promise that was made in the ad, in the email, in the social media post, in the link on your website. If you do not know what promise was made for a page that you're building, you are not building a landing page. You're building something else. You're building a home page or an information page or a routing page. So keep the promise made in the ad, email, social media post, or link. The second job of the landing page is to get the visitor to make a choice. Bring the visitor to choice. If you're putting anything on the page that is not designed to make the visitor feel more comfortable and confident taking action on the page, then you're not building a landing page. You're building something else. So a landing page has two jobs only. Keep the promise. Get the visitor to make a choice. So when we create a landing page, we start with a pure solution of web page. Pure as the driving snow. And we mix in two elements. We mix in offer. And the offer of the page should match the promise. And we mix in form. And the form is the most common way for someone to take action. Fields, buttons, links, all qualify as forms. So this is a perfect landing page. It has an offer, submit, and a way to take action, simply a button. Now, of course, um, the problem is that submit really isn't a very good call to action. Um, it's the most common word you'll find on buttons around the internet, but it's not going to really entice people to take action on, on our landing pages typically. So we can go and we can collect our first round of information. We can go and find the data that can tell us not only what the offer should be, because the the ad promise told us that, but what the words we should use in the offer are. And if you go down into the basement of your, your business, there'll be an old wooden door there. Go ahead and push that open, but do it slowly because the people inside, the light is going to blind their eyes a little bit. Those are your PPC people. They're in there day and night working away, trying to get your paid search ads to perform better for you but they'll be glad to see you and you should ask them for a little bit of data. Ask them for a spreadsheet of the ads that you're getting and what, how many impressions those ads have seen, how many interactions or conversions you've gotten from those ads. And what you wanna do is find those ads that have gotten a lot of impressions. Uh, again, we know that sample size is really important. So if we go in and look at those ads that have gotten the most impressions, we are going to be believe that data more. So here's a conversion rate of 1%, but eh, not very many impressions or conversions, but this looks more interesting. I believe this number better. Um, so this ad probably has words that I should be using on my landing pages. CRO consulting as opposed to conversion agency. These ads don't seem to be performing as well. So we're using AdWords to decide how we phrase our landing page. We did this with one of our clients, um, Hunter Douglas. And Hunter Douglas produces high-end 
window treatments, blinds, curtains, and these are actually motorized blinds you can buy from them that can be controlled from an iPad or that detect when the sun is coming from the window and automatically open and close. So these are expensive and we figured that the buyers would not be price sensitive. They wouldn't care so much about saving a little bit of money. They wanted, would want to buy the best thing. But when we went and looked at the AdWords ads, we found that the best performing ads were these, 20% off and $100 off. So we thought we were dealing with people who were relational buyers, whose biggest fear was buying the wrong thing. But these ads tell us that we're really dealing with transactional buyers, buyers who are afraid of spending $1 more than they could have. Relational buyers see shopping as part of the cost of buying. Transactional shoppers see buying as part of the fun. They like to shop. They like to go and find the best deal. Another dollar here, another 10% there. We were seeing these kinds of shoppers. Unfortunately, our landing page said strange things like, take the stress out of shopping. Transactional buyers don't want the stress taken out of shopping. They want it all in there. They don't want to know about just unbelievable savings. They want to know about specific discounts. So we rewrote the landing page based on what we learned from this. For instance, for the $100 off power shades, we changed it. We included that $100 specifically. We said in-home manufacturer discounts, combined discounts, limited time. Transactional buyers hate to lose their, their um, savings and lock in your savings. So with all of this, we were able to increase the conversion rate 40%. 40% more people were scheduling visits from designers to have these, um, these blinds sized in their home. That's a pretty good use of some existing data. We didn't have to go do any research. We didn't have to go do any science or anything. Go and look at your email service provider and see what you can learn here. Here is a, is a little uh, study that I did. I pulled these from our email service provider. Um, this, uh, these are the subject lines of pages, and I've ranked them based on their click-through rate. So if people are clicking on my emails, I'm assuming that that topic for that email was appealing to them. And what I found out was this, the most clicked emails on my list said things like writing, copywriting, persuasion, value proposition, business tagline. What am I learning from this data, this data that already exists out there? I'm learning that my audience is interested in the words that help conversion, persuasive conversion. So what did I do? We went out and we created a lead magnet. We created an offer that we would trade their contact information for, 21 quick and easy CRO copywriting hacks. And if you'll notice, we also saw all of these emails had begun with numbers. The top six began with numbers, and some other ones here at the top also began with numbers. So when we named our lead magnet, we included a number at the beginning of the title. You can learn quite a bit from data that you already have sitting around. So for our um, experiment, we're gonna assume that we're the United States Mint, the part of our government that produces dollar bills. And we're gonna pretend that the US Mint is selling dollar bills for half off, selling it for 50 cents. Now you might be saying, Brian, that's a crazy offer. Everyone's going to go for that. Everyone is going to go and buy 50 cent dollar bills. But the truth is, in each of your businesses, you have a great product or a great service that solves a significant problem at a great price with great terms, uh, free shipping, generous return policies. You have great offers in your businesses and you still have trouble converting people. Well, I have news for you. The U.S. Mint selling dollar bills for 50 cents would have just as much trouble as you. They would have to design a very smart landing page. Um, and you can imagine all the rule, all the reasons, like who's going to believe such a great offer? 
So if we assume for our landing page that we're getting traffic from a paid search ad, discounted dollar bills, 50% off new US dollars from the leading reseller, www.mint.gov, and it's coming to a landing page like this. Now this landing page does a pretty good job of keeping the promise and asking the visitor to make a choice, to do something. Click here. It has all of the elements. So the problem is this, if somebody clicks on this button, nothing's going to happen. Nothing to help the mint and nothing to help the visitor. So we've got to come up with something. Why don't we ask for an email address? Then we can start using email to communicate and sell them these dollar bills. If we ask for permission along with that email address, we'll have a lower conversion rate. Fewer people will opt in, but those people that do opt in will be better qualified and more likely to buy. But this is the internet. Why don't we go ahead and ask for a credit card? Or better yet, I think we'd have a really high conversion rate if we asked for a friend's credit card number. The truth is that if we want to know the credit card number, we need a lot more information. We need to know not only the number, but we need to know their name. We need to know the address. We need to know um, the security code on the back of the car that no one is supposed to see. We'll need an expiration date. And the problem is that we are now asking for a lot of very personal information. And what is this going to do? It's going to reduce our conversion rate. We say that there is a contaminant in our reaction that we started. We call this contaminant abandonment because when someone abandons the website, they go away. We give it the symbol for the element argon from the periodic table because when someone abandons your landing page, they are gone. I don't know how well that's going to translate into Spanish, but uh, it's a joke that kills in English. <laughs> so here's what we have to do. What's that? You kind of get it. Okay. <laughs> so here's what we have to do. We've got to call up our copywriter and say, ring, ring, ring. Hey, listen, we've got a great offer, an unbelievable offer but we have to ask for quite a bit of personal information. Mr. Copywriter or Miss Copywriter, can you write some copy that will build out the value proposition and maybe handle some of the objections that our visitors are going to have? And the copywriter will say, yes, this is exactly what I do. This is my calling, but I need to know everything. I need to review marketing studies. I want to see your personas. I want to interview customers. I want to talk to your salespeople and your customer support people. They will want to know everything. And they'll come back with a variety of different things. So here, are, for instance, are just eight headlines, all of which keep the promise of our offer, the ad for the Mint, and they're going to have very different conversion rates. Double your money instantly. 50% off US dollars for a limited time. Transactional buyers will be will like that. And then there's some crazy things you can put in there. IRS says, sorry, the IRS is our internal revenue service that collects all of our taxes. Obviously, we don't like the tax man. So the IRS says, sorry, sells half price dollar bills. How do we narrow this down? The other thing that the copywriter should be doing is including what images should be involved with the copy. Images are so powerful, you should spend the same amount of time on images that you spend on um, copy. But unfortunately, what usually happens is somebody goes off and they go to stock photography sites and they pull images like this. Two shaking hands. What does that really mean? Well, this is the test. You know that you have stock photos on your, fo on your site, photos that aren't gonna work for you, uh, if you can't write a caption that isn't ridiculous. So shaking hands, we would say the caption is, we want to shake your hand so that you can start sending us checks. We want to shake your hand so we can start invoicing you. We know what that means, but that's not something you would put on your website or your landing pages. We call this business porn. And this is the sort of thing that will work against you. How about this? The call us today, the woman with the ha her hair in a bun. The only thing I could write for this is this person doesn't work here, but she's pretty. 
not the kind of caption we would put on our website. Why wouldn't we use an actual employee's image there? And then crazy things like this. I actually got this from a website. And I mean, looking at it, I, the only thing I can imagine that we should say was, there's a man in our website and he's touching things. Because that's exactly what we're seeing. This is business porn. And then it's very common for us to have people from all races and, and all genders in our photography. Um, none of these people work at the company. None of these people are customers. The only caption I could come up with is, we aren't racist or sexist, and we aren't sure why we had to point that out. So you see how this caption test will tell you if you have ridiculous images on your website. Now, when you have a lot of images, a lot of headlines, I recommend the five-second test. This is one of the first tools I want to introduce to you. The name is usabilityhub.com, but there are others available, and I suspect you'll be able to find some, uh, some Spanish language sites as well. Um, what these allow you to do is put your creative in front of other people without having to run focus groups in your office. You can sit at your desk, upload your creative, and they will bring as many people as you want, 25 people, 50 people, 100 people to look at your creative. You can ask them questions about it and see um, what works best. With the five second test, which is just one of the kinds of tests you can run, the visitors sh see your creative and then you get to ask, they, they see it for five seconds, then you get to ask them some questions, it goes away. So if you have a situation like this where you have multiple images and multiple um, headlines, you can find out using this very inexpensive panel, these visitors are about $2 a piece, you can use this to find out which of these combinations is most likely to work. And the questions you would ask them after they see each of these for five seconds, or the, 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 after they see one of these for five seconds in each panel is, what does this company do? What would you click on if you wanted to take action? Does this company seem credible to you? Can you name at least one of the primary benefits of this, which are listed here. So this will tell you what, primarily, what headline and image combination, plus the visibility of the buttons, is going to work best for you. The human brain makes a lot of decisions in hundreds of a millisecond. Five seconds doesn't seem like a lot of time, but it absolutely works. So I went out and did some tests and found this image the product in its packaging, and I put a caption on there to make sure that I understood they, so they understood that the image is communicating that this is a real US dollar. And this is the copy that uh, our copywriter wrote. The copywriter found out that everybody knows what a dollar bill is. They just need to make sure that it's genuine. And so she um, provided some additional information um, in the form of bullets. Uh, you might say, I need a better copywriter, and you probably would be right. What we're also going to do is we're going to add some things to the page to help build trust. So the copywriter says, we really need some images of our clients. Of course, we want to use the logo for the Mint. And we can also borrow trust from these bank, uh, these bank logos. So now, once we have these elements established, is the time to invite the designer in. Usually when we build a page or do a redesign, we start with the designers and they come to us with gray pages or, or wireframes. Now is the time to get them involved. And they may say things like, why don't we scale back some of these um, client logos so that they don't compete with this? Why don't we make this bigger and bolder so visitors know we're asking them to take to make a choice? And we can go ahead and add a, an arrow so that it's very clear. Arrows just work. And the designer might come back with this. So what's the problem here? Well. We've lost the product image in favor of this really strange header image. All this is really going to do is slow down the load time on our landing page. It doesn't communicate anything, and it's a poor use of image for, the, for landing pages. And nobody fills out teal blanks. They need to be white. They need to be gray. This requires a visitor to stop and think, oh, wow, what am I supposed to do? Are these buttons? You can understand how this might create some discontinuity. But what you can do is you can go out and get some information for your visitor. We can now do eye tracking sitting at our desks. It's the same thing as Usability Hub, just a different service. Um, the name of the company is called Sticky.ai. And what you do is you put your page 
uh, you're creative in front of people. They bring people who are looking at the, your page and they can track their eyes where they're looking on the page. Our webcams have gotten so good, you can tell where people are looking on the page. So here's an example. Um, we've got Lyft and Uber as the two ride sharing companies here in the States. I'm sure you have them in Argentina as well. Which one of these is doing the best job with their landing page and getting visitors to sign up? Well, we can put these in front of people and, and find out how many people are seeing these buttons. That's going to tell us how likely they are to take action. And we find out that Lyft does a better job, 83% versus 58%. So we would expect the, the Lyft designed to perform better. So you can do this as well and bring this back to your customers. Um, I'm sorry, bring this back to your designer and he might say, oh, okay, I get it now. And so this is a little bit more reasonable design. We have the product image. We have the proof showing up with bullets. He's used um, font size and color to make the proof stand out, centered and enlarged the headline. And there is no doubt that we're asking the visitor to make a choice here. So this is a design that while a bit less pleasing to the eye is likely to really to generate more sales. So now we launch a no. And we're going to make sure that we have analytics under there so that we can track that. And I recommend that you look for a heat mapping tool. I'm going to be showing you some of the, I'm going to show you the names of these tools that we use. But anyone can look at this design and answer the question, which of these pages has a scrolling problem? Which of these problem, which of these pages is not getting people down the page? The brighter the color, the more people are scrolling. People are stopping here. And down there is where the call to action is. This lady is drowning. We can also use it to see which offers. This is for a resort. Golf is the most important thing. People come from all over the world to golf there. What is the most exciting thing on their offer page? Free breakfast. Free breakfast should probably be at the top of this list. How would we know have known otherwise? I also recommend that you do thank you page surveys. Um, the thank you page survey is where you um, pop up a, a, a questionnaire a window on the thank you page or on the receipt page that asks the visitor what almost kept them from buying. We did this with one of our customers. We were, they were selling a whole lot of their light product. And this is a product that plugs into your car and connects your car's computer to your cell phone. They wanted to sell more of the pro. And so... Um, we found out that the reason people were buying light was because we had too many choices. What made you buy light instead of pro is what we asked everybody who bought the light product and we got great feedback. Um, the uh, gist of it though was that people didn't know what live vehicle tracking means. They don't know what event-based apps means. They didn't understand what we were doing. So we had an idea to make things simpler. This is where we bring in the Supreme Court, the top court in the land and do an A-B test. So we tested the old one with lots of choices against this one that had a much fewer choices and them choose easier. We increased the conversion rate by 13%. We increased the revenue per visit by 24%, which just means we were selling more of the high priced products. So what we're doing is we're changing design fundamentally here, fundamentally. Um, this is the way it used to be. We used to do a lot of research and then we would hand the design off to the design team and they would use their experience and intuition to make all the choices. And we wouldn't know how smart they were until after we launched. This is what happened to finish line. What we can do now is we can do the user research, but then we can have several ideas for positioning. We can test copy. When we feel like we have good copy, we can test different images. When we feel like we have that together, we can test wireframes with eye tracking and things like that. Test the layout. We can test mock-ups and put those in front of people. So we're not just using our intuition, we're also using data and research. This is how we are able to do guaranteed website redesigns. And it also has benefits. You can manage helicopter executives, we call them. They come in and they change everything at the last minute. Well, they're a sample size of one. If you have some data that says we designed it because we did research, they are going to be less likely to come in and change things. Same thing with agencies that you're working for. There was a great agency working with Finish Line. How do you know if they're making good decisions? Data and research. If you're stealing ideas from competitors or other sites you like, 
make sure you're stealing only the ideas that you like with these sorts of techniques. And as I said, any digital marketer is going to have to know how to use these tools because they can't make mistakes when the data is so cheap and easy. And my favorite part is that this is a creative safety net that allows you to do crazy things, let you try crazy things that really could move the needle. Many of us are now just safe. We're just doing safe things. If you can collect some data around an idea before you launch it, maybe there's some interesting things you should be doing that you wouldn't have discovered otherwise. And of course, you're going to make more money from all of your campaigns and all of your redesigns. So Finish Line was smart enough to actually save their website on another, so they could get, roll back to the original site. So they rolled back to it, to this design. And I recently went and checked and found out that this is what the website looks like now. Now, how come they didn't have another crazy drop in performance? Well, when you look at their, um, when you look at their, their website, you see that they've got heat map re reporting. They've got session recordings where they're watching people use the site, A-B testing software, three kinds of analytics, a tag manager. So they're using data in their redesigns now, and this is why they're able to do it successfully. So this is a page, you should screenshot this. This is the tools that we use all the way through our design process, starting with qualitative information all the way up to more behavioral uh, uh, data. Um, and these are the product names that I've been talking about. Um, we love user testing. Hotjar is uh, uh, doing a great job. We love Crazy Egg and Inspectlet for recording things. And then the A-B testing tools and analytics tools are all there as well. So um, again, if you want to get this uh, copy, copy Hacks uh, ebook, um, I recommend it. I flip through it every time um, I go to write some copy. So it reminds me of some of the key things that just work and that I need to consider in my copywriting. And I um, assume that we have some time for questions. The use of pop-ups, well, if you ask anyone if they like pop-ups, they will all universally tell you that they hate them, that they don't want them. But we have never seen a situation, especially with ex exit intent pop-overs, that pop up when somebody looks like they're leaving. We've never seen a situation in which it didn't improve lead generation. Collecting emails is typically what these, these pop-ups are used for. Um, so an exit intent pop-over, that show that may offers, for instance, a, a, an ebook or a report in exchange for an email address does very well. On e-commerce sites, these typically offer um, a discount. Uh, we have several clients that have entrance modals. So when someone first opens the site, they get an offer for 10% off in order to get that email address. They always improve the, um, the collection of emails and we've not seen a situation um, in which, that I can remember in which that has reduced conversions or reduced sales. So the answer is uh, use them, use them. And there's a number that you can use. So the uh, entrance, exit, uh, for blogs, I recommend scroll triggers for somebody who's reading an article and they get halfway down the page, go ahead and pop something up and offer for them to get a related item. Um, and I think um, every e-commerce site should, should be exp exploring what combination of these to use on their category pages, on their product pages, and even on their cart and checkout pages. Great. Great. That, that was, um, I think, got clear out the doubts that it was in here. So, um, okay, we are, I think we need to move forward right now. Um, there are a lot more questions, but as we were saying before, if you need something uh, else, you need to know, write us down in the hashtag EMMS2018 and we will answer it. You can also uh, mention Brian to answer as well. Um, well. Thank you so much, Brian. Do you want to say something else before we say goodbye? Yes, um, M-A-S-S. Wow. That's my personal. That's my personal Twitter, and also, as you see on screen, um, con conversion sigh is uh, for is for the company. So either one of those will work. Okay. B Massey, B M A S S E Y, or conversion. S -I. All right. Okay. 
so everybody follow Brian and be in touch with him, ask him questions. You're going to have a lot of questions, sure thing, that you need to to answer on, on Twitter. There are a lot of questions, but we're actually running out of time, so uh, we're going to move forward with the uh, We have one questions. more question. Hold oh, on. Okay, we'll, we'll have we, one. The last question you're going to answer right now is, um, if we must redesign our website, it's a question that is uh, that the people is are, our audience are dealing to today. When when should you design yeah. your website? Uh, there's two answers: um, never, <laughs> and Basically and never. and always. So never if you need a new if you need a new platform. Uh, then you have to redesign. If you're moving to a new back-end platform, like you're changing your cart or you're changing your content management system, if you're completely rebranding your company or product, you have to redesign and, and do that. But otherwise, be always redesigning step by step by step using some of the tools that I've talked about today. That's the best way to do it. Always be redesigning. But it's crazy to make a whole bunch of decisions okay. and push them out all at once. for coming here to the EMMS 2018. We hope that you have, um, that you are glad as well and that you have fun. Uh, our audience is telling us that they're so happy and they, that they have learned a lot today. So thank you so much. It was really, really helpful. It was thank you. very, very helpful, really. I mean, actually, uh, it's it's awesome how uh, by the use of data that we have in our sites and all these techniques that, that are, I mean, are, uh, we, it's an, in our reach that we actually can access to, to have access to all this kind of technology. We can actually use it in, in order to get better and have better results. Exactly. So, yeah. And increase your profits, which is one of the best goals that every single business, it doesn't matter the size of the business, I think is the, what we're all willing to accomplish, right? Yeah, yeah. Every one of us is going to get so much better thanks to this data. Yeah, exactly. So let's get uh, our hands into data, as you were saying, and it's time to try new things and use it in order to improve the user experience.